let us move on to the first session that is the approaches to the cervical spine it is indeed an honor and privilege for me to introduce the panelist dr vanan vello who is the head of the department of neurosurgery in jj hospital mumbai dr kreshidhar who is the director institute of neurosciences and spinal disorders global hospital chennai dr dr hs batoi director and head of mass hospital super speciality hospital mohali punjab and abida shah assistant professor k in hospital mumbai now before we start with the first talk i would just like to inform all the delegates that the q and a question that the q and a will be taken at the end of the session and anyone who wants to ask a question can please type in the question in the comment section and we will ask the questions to the panelists or to the speakers and depending upon the time availability now i request the first speaker dr sanjeev bihari for his presentation on surgical anatomy of the cervical spine dr bihari is the head of the department of uh, department of neurosurgery sgpd ims lucknow dr bihari can please start the presentation can we have dr bihari's presentation yes 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 and c7 vertebrae are regarded as being atypical because c1 does not have any vertebral body and has an anterior posterior arch and anterior posterior tubercle c2 has an odontoid process and a bifid spinous process and c7 is the transitional vertebra between the cervical and the thoracic spine and has the most prominent spinous process which is known as the vertebra prominence the lordosis of the cervical spine is about 20 to 40 degrees and this changes to a thoracic kyphosis of approximately 20 to 40 degrees the lamina of the vertebral body above overhangs the lamina of the vertebral body below the ligamentum flavum arises from the edge of the lamina of the vertebral body below and also from its posterior superior aspect and then gets attached to the edge of the lamina of the vertebral body above and also its anterior inferior aspect that is why whenever a laminectomy is done it is always done from an inferior to a superior aspect the c1 nerve root emerges from above the posterior arch of the atlas the c2 nerve root emerges from between the c1 and c2 vertebral bodies the c3 nerve root emerges through the intervertebral foramina between c3 and c4 vertebral bodies and so on for the caudal vertebrae likewise the the c8 nerve root emerges from between the c7 and t1 intervertebral foramina the atlanto axial region does not have any intervertebral foramina the capaciousness of the c1 c2 space available in the region is responsible for the large extradural or dumbbell neurofibromas that grow to take a large area without causing neurological deficits increase of the intervertebral foramen at each level includes two contiguous vertebral bodies and their disc space anteriorly forming the onco vertebral joint the superior and inferior articular processes forming the zygarpo facial joint posteriorly 
and the pedicles of the contiguous vertebrae forming the superior and inferior margins of the intervertebral foramina. The natural tendency of the oncovertebral joints and zygapophyseal joints to provide stability to the cervical spine occurs in the form of bony expansion into the intervertebral foramina as osteophytes that may cause radiculopathy or into the cervical spinal canal causing myelopathy. The range of movement of the cervical spine is as follows 80 to 90 degrees of flexion, 70 degrees of extension and 90 degrees of external rotation. The flexion movement at the atlanto-occipital joint is around 10 degrees. At the atlanto-axial joint it has it is about 5 degrees and the subaxial spine has an intersegmental flow of uh, flexion motion so that it compensates for rest of the uh, flexion movement. When we look at extension, at the atlanto-occipital joint 25 degrees of extension occurs, at the atlanto-axial joint 10 degrees of flexion occurs and in the subaxial spine the rest of the extension occurs with the maximum extension occurring at C5-6 level. The rotatory movement at the neck is limited by the capsular ligament of the facet joints. Out of 90 degrees of rotation to either side, nearly 45 degrees occurs at the atlantoaxial joint and the rest occurs from C3 to C7. The lateral flexion is uh, distributed from the C2 to C7 levels. The occipital condyles form an ellipsoid or a condylite joint with the kidney shaped superior articular process on the superior surface of bilateral lateral masses of the atlas. This joint permits flexion and extension movements or the yes movements to occur at the neck. The inferior articular process on the inferior surface of lateral mass of the atlas forms a planar joint with the superior articular process of axis and allows the rotation of neck to occur or the no movements to occur. The lateral masses of the atlas form its strongest area. From the medial border of the two lateral masses, the transverse ligament, which is the horizontal part of the tectorial membrane, keeps the odontoid process in the pivot synovial joint with the posterior surface of the anterior arch of atlas. In case of transverse ligament incompetence, atlantoaxial dislocation occurs, an atlantal dental interval of greater than 3 mm becomes significant. In Jefferson's fracture or the burst fracture of atlas, the sum of the lateral mass displacement greater than 8 mm means that there is transverse ligament incompetence. The anterior tubercle situated on the anterior arch of atlas is an important landmark. In transferal decompression, the palpation of the anterior tubercle and the two anterior facet joints gives a good idea of the midline even if there is a rotatory component present in the atlantoaxial dislocation. In lateral mass screw placement, the screw is directed medially and upwards 5 to 10 degrees uh, aiming for the anterior tubercle of the atlas. The foramen transversarium of the atlas with the vertebral artery is thus lateral to the trajectory. The lateral one third of the superior surface of the posterior arch of the atlas harbors the groove for the vertebral artery after it emerges from the C1 foramen transversarium and before it becomes intradural. The C12 dissection should be confined to the space between the atlas and the axis and should not extend to the superior surface of the lateral one third of the posterior arch of the atlas. This avoids injuring the vertebral artery. The inferior edge of the posterior arch of the atlas may be drilled to expose the lateral mass of atlas especially when this is occipitalized and there is condylar hypoplasia. This may be also very useful if ganglion preserving C1, C2 um, facet joint surgery is being performed in which the screw placement above the C2 ganglion is facilitated by the complete exposure of the C1 lateral mass by the drilling of the posterior arch of C1. Considering the applied anatomy of the axis, the odontoid process is made of many ossification centers. So there will be intervening cortical bone between the trabecular bone 
and this is evident on the MR imaging. So when we are drilling the odontoid, the assessment of the cortical bone in relation to the MRI sagittal images will give you a fairly good idea where you are with respect to the height of the odontoid. One important question which often arises is what is the difference between a pedicle and pars interarticularis in relation to the axis vertebra. The pedicle is the part of the bone which is present between the superior articular process and the body and odontoid process of the axis vertebra. The pars interarticularis is the part of the bone between the superior and inferior articular process. So therefore, if one has to put a pedicle screw then one has to direct a more, uh, the screw at more angulation from a lateral to medial aspect. Whereas if one is going through the pars interarticularis, then one has to stay parallel to the medial border of pars interarticularis towards the C1, C2 joint. The foramen transversarium of the axis is located lateral to the facet joint as well as the pars interarticularis. So if one is following the medial border of the pars interarticularis in a direction which is uh, about 15 to 20 degrees upwards and medially, then one is unlikely to encounter the vertebral artery unless the vertebral artery is placed posterior to the C1-C2 joint. One important thing that one should really take care of is, is a high riding vertebral artery which can actually indent through the inferior surface of the pars interarticularis and may be injured when the pedicle screw through or the pars interarticularis screw is being placed. In case a translaminar screw fixation is being performed through the lamina of axis then the two screws are at different levels so that uh, their profiles do not conflict with each other. Coming to the subaxial spine, the approximate transverse length of a vertebral body is between 22 and 25 millimeters, and the diameter of the spinal cord uh, at the cervical level is approximately between 8 to 11 millimeters. So in order to create the anterior gutter to decompress the thecal sac adequately, a gutter of at least 18 to 20 uh, millimeters has to be created. As one can notice, the pedicle, which is the part between the superior articular process and the body of a subaxial vertebra is very, very narrow and very close to the um, foramen transversarium. Therefore, it is much safer to do a lateral mass fixation. The trajectory of the screw in this case, in contrast to the axis and atlas vertebra, is directed laterally. The foramen transversarium of the subaxial cervical vertebra is located more medially as compared to their lateral masses, and therefore. When the trajectory of the screw is directed laterally, then the screw tip is unlikely to injure the vertebral artery. The two ways in which vertebral artery can actually get injured are number one, if one strays beyond the margin of the vertebral body towards the foramen transversarium, and especially if one is using uh, monopolar forceps to uh, dissect out the longus coli muscles on the two sides, then one can injure the vertebral artery. The second way in which the vertebral artery can be injured is by an oblique drilling of the vertebral body and in this case the vertebral artery is likely to be injured not at the superior or inferior aspect of the vertebral body but rather in the middle part of the vertebral body <coughs> as the drill breaches the foramen transversarium. While doing a laminectomy and a foraminotomy of the cervical spine, one has to be very careful that not more than one third of this articular process is drilled or, and removed. 
otherwise one is likely to destabilize the cervical spine and a fusion might be required. The unique features of the C7 vertebra include a prominent spinous process. Usually the pedicle and lateral mass is very thin so that transpedicular or lateral mass screw fixation may not be possible. The transverse foramen of C7 does not contain the vertebral artery which skirts along it. Occasionally an extra cervical rib may also arise from this junctional vertebra. The final point I would like to make is regarding the vertebral artery at the level of C1 and C2. The foramen transfer serum of C1 and C2 are placed more laterally as compared to the subaxial spine and this provides a laxity to the vertebral artery to permit neck movements. So in the region of the neck, turning the neck to one side by 45 degrees compromises one vertebral artery and turning it to 90 degrees compromises both vertebral arteries. I am grateful to you for your kind attention. Thank you sir, thank you so much. Uh, knowing the anatomy of the region that a surgeon wants to operate upon is perhaps the most important thing for any surgery and I would like to thank and I would like to thank Dr. Sanjay Bihari for covering all the important aspects of anatomy of the cervical spine. Thank you so much, sir. There is a small change in the sequence of the lectures. Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee would be taking the second lecture and Dr. Manas Panigrahi would be taking the third lecture. So our next speaker is Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee. Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee is the professor and the head of the Department of Neurosurgery, Vivekanand Institute of Medical Sciences and Park Cleaning, Kolkata. And he will be showing a step-by-step surgical video of ACDF and corpectomy. Dr. Sandeep, please. Good morning. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. your slide is visible and you're audible, sir. Great. Uh, right. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak in this um, very uh, uh, gathering of uh, galaxies of, of neurosurgery in this country. I'm going to talk about something very simple. And I'm going to talk about uh, the approach to the anterior cervical spine. And in my opinion, this approach is based on the fundamental anatomy of three muscles. The first is the anterior border of the sternomastoid, the medial border, if you like, which is where you need to dissect first. The second is the posterior border of the superior belly of the homohyoid, where I think you need to dissect second because you can then move that homohyoid muscle medially and that gives you a fantastic interval to go into the anterior neck. And finally, it's the medial border of the longus coli, which guides you because if you see the two medial border of the longus coli, it tells you where the midline of that cervical spine is. And it also is the ideal place to put in your retractors as we will see during the surgery. So the, the aim of the exposure is to go between these two lines, the posterior border of the superior belly of the homohyoid and the anterior border of the sternomastoid. Just while we're on this picture, one important point to make is if you're going into C3-4, which is here, then you must be in a plane where you can see the submandibular salivary gland. If you can't, then you're too low. Right, what we're gonna talk about essentially is positioning the image guided incision, which means that you take the CM and then mark the incision, depending on where the level you want to operate, the soft tissue dissection, the radiological conformation, the decompression, which fundamentally is decompression of the dura, not the posterior longitude ligament, the grafting, and finally, always closing the wound with a drain. So that's the, the basic positioning. This is not my patient, but it's just a photograph I use to, to illustrate two points. Number one, uh, you can strap that shoulder down uh, if you want, but I, I often prefer that somebody pulls the hand down rather than strap it because that puts unnecessary pressure on the brachial plexus for a prolonged surgery. The second is this, the sandbag should not be in between the shoulder blades, but it should be higher up to stop the neck from being hyperextended. 
And then, of course, you, we put in a needle and get a CM picture to tell us where we are going to operate. And uh, I still prefer to mark this out when I'm in doing this procedure uh, with trainees so that we can see the midline, we can mark the incision, and we can mark the anterior border of the sternum asteroid, which is a guide to the surgery. Transverse incision, the very important thing is if you undermine it, you can expose that much of the platysma. So you have a huge exposure, even with the transverse uh, exposure. I told you about the muscles, and I'll show that to you later. You mark the level, you decide that you're at the right level. And then, of course, you do the decompression. When you're doing a corpectomy, we re resect the anterior half of the vertebral body so that we can get that bone for a graft. And then we use the drill uh, further down. It's very important to make sure that you have uh, interrogated the epidural space and that you have removed the posterior osteophytes adequately to cause decompression. And finally, you have to remove the posterior long ligament, all its layers, so you're right down to the dura compression. And then you can put in your graft, whichever way you want. And let's now go through the video because that's what's going to be this exercise. So this is a two level ACDF that we're doing. You can see again that, that um, we put in, a, this is an LP needle to mark out the level. And then the when I'm doing a two level, I would often, this is the midline, which I think is very important. The skin incision, I think, should go just beyond the midline. And instead of a transverse, you can use a transverse incision with a little upward oblique extension. Again, this is very important, undermining the skin on both sides, because if you do that, then you get a very, very large uh, area to work. And you see how much you can expose with a, with a, with a self-retaining retractor. And then uh, we split the platysma in the direction of the fibers. And then finally, uh, feel the carotid, work along the medial border of the sternum asteroid, the posterior border of the homohyoid, and that gets you to the level. And just to speed this up in the interest of time, because I don't want to delay uh, Manas, who have already uh, upset by postponing his talk. So then you let check the level. We're doing two levels, remember? Now I want you to see this. I put in this wet gauze and I put this gauze underneath the longer scoli on the two sides so that my blade sits on the, the on that gauze and that gauze is underneath the longer scoli. So I have the blade going underneath the longer scoli, but that blade also is protected by the gauze. So you have the gauze and the longer scoli protecting the carotid and the esophagus as you put in this self-retaining uh, cloud retractor. Uh, just to tell you, at this point of time, our anesthetist routinely would measure the intracuff pressure, and we do routine monitoring of, uh, of the pressure in the endotracheal tube so that we can always measure the cuff pressure as we are putting in the retractors, and they're deflating the balloon if necessary, or we are readjusting the retractor so that the cuff pressure is not raised significantly, definitely not about 40 during the entire procedure. I would start the discectomy macroscopically, remove as much as I can, and then we get in the, sorry, we get in the operating microscope. And just the important thing about this is that the posterior longitudinal ligament has many layers, and you have to be sure that you've divided all the layers when you're doing the surgery. That's the best technique to use when you want to divide the layers, putting the the hook in, a blunt hook underneath the posterior longitudinal ligament and then dividing it by a number 15 blade. You will notice that that's, you need at least to divide two layers of the posterior longitudinal ligament to get to the dura. And at least in my book, if you're operating on a patient with a cervical compressive myelopathy, it is absolutely imperative to divide the posterior longitudinal ligament and expose the dura from one root canal to the other. And that's, that's uh, the technique that we use. You can see it from one side and you can see the other side going all the way. And I'm not happy until I can see that dura from one root canal to the other. And then we clean up the, the soft tissue. This is really a little bit of uh, beautification, if you like. The important thing here is to note that the upper vertebral body slopes downwards. 
and the lower vertebral body slopes upwards in its posterior part. So it's a good idea to take off a little bit of the sloping part of the vertebral body before uh, you think your dissection is complete. This is two levels. So we, we go on and repeat the same thing at the upper level. Again, just to show you the technique of dividing that posterior longitudinal ligament. I think that's very important to divide it all along and to make sure that you have got a complete Close, uh, complete decompression, then you can use any one of these. This is just uh, one of the zero profile uh, techniques that we are using. And uh, once you've got it in, and of course it has to be zero profile, which means it has to sit perfectly inside. And, uh, and then that's the picture at the end on the CM. Okay, so just, just to tell you about a corpectomy very quickly, that the difference after exposure is, I tend to use this drill, which is the, the match head, and I tend to use it right across the entire area of the corpectomy. You will notice here we have uh, up, up, uh, side by side uh, as well as up and down retractors. So this is the, 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 the disk space above, and we go along the two sides, and we go along the disk space at the bottom. And the reason is, with this, you can actually lift up this big piece of bone. So that's very important that you can, um, you can uh, keep that bone and use that for a graft. And that is why in a corpectomy, I tend to do this. Then of course you check, you can check the level. What I tend to do next is to identify the end plates of the vertebra below and above, which will take the two ends of the graft or the prosthesis or whatever you're putting. And identify these end plates because it's very important to know what's going to be the upper end and the lower end of your corpectomy. And once we've done this, we remove the bone in the middle. And then do the final bit of drilling. Then I get in the diamond drill and the rest of the procedure is done with the diamond drill and then uh, the cleaning up. And that's the end of the drilling. And I'll come back to the drilling in a minute. And then of course you put in the cage. The important thing again about the cage is if you want to maintain the lordosis, the lower end of the cage goes in more than the upper end does before you expand it. And that's quite important. Just two quick critical things to tell you before, um, before I finish. Number one, when you're doing an endoscopy, <laughs> and you're trying to do the decompression, you will often encounter bleeding because the moment you decompress, sometimes in the extradural tissue, you will get bleeding. And I'll show you exactly how you deal with that. I, I don't think I've ever used bipolar diathermy here to stop this extradural bleeding. And when you get a bleeding uh, as you decompress, and of course, if you decompress adequately, the bleeding is a good sign. It's a sign you've done good decompression. All you need to do is put a tail cotton keep your sucker on it and continue the operation. And after a while, when you've done the full decompression, uh, you just need to lift that, that bit of um, tail cotton and you will find that the bleeding has stopped. Very rarely you may need to elevate the head end, but it is extremely rare. And you can see even with that in place, you can still do that decompression, make sure you get to the dura, don't stop because you've got some extra dural bleeding. And that's very important. And the final, final thing I'd like to show you is about a corpectomy, uh, is when I do a corpectomy, I like to drill all the way up to the posterior longitudinal ligament. A lot of people suggest you should leave a thin layer of bone and then use an upcut punch. I find that's uh, self-defeating because the idea of a drill is that you don't put any instrument between the bone and the dura. And I tend to drill all the way up to the posterior longitudinal ligament. And if you see, uh, this is, just see the end of that drilling. And you can see that uh, I drill with, the, I don't use an upcut punch uh, in the midline at all. It's just on the sides. And then finally, if you want a real good decompression after you've cleaned everything up, it's a good idea to again, divide the posterior longitudinal ligament completely. And that's the dura. That's how the dura should look at the end of even a corpectomy. This is actually a two level corpectomy. And you can see we, divide the posterior longitudinal ligament and expose the dura. And of course, again, the final bit of uh, putting in that expandable cage and the plate, 
And important, as I said, is to ensure that the lower end of the cage goes down below so that you can get a lordosis that is restored and it looks like this at the end of the procedure. So just to take home messages, use the three muscle landmarks, the sternomastoid, the superior belly of the omohyoid, and the longus coli, check the level, monitor the intratracheal cuff pressure when you're doing an anterior pr uh, uh, procedure because it certainly reduces dysphagia and voice changes after the procedure. I like to drill right up to the posterior longitudinal ligament, cut all the layers of the posterior longitudinal ligament, and be aware of how you have to put in your cage or processes to maintain the low doses. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep, for a wonderful video. And ACTF and copiectomy are one of the most common procedures performed on the cervical spine. And uh, I'm sure our delegates would have learned the nuances of this procedure. Thank you so much. And as I had said earlier, the next speaker is Dr. Manas Panigrahi. He's one of the most versatile neurosurgeons uh, of the country. And he would, and he's a senior consultant neurosurgeon at Kim's Hospital, Hyderabad. And he would be talking about surgical planning, anterior versus posterior approach. Dr. Manas. Can you have Dr. Manas slide, please? When to do uh, the anterior or the posterior approach. Uh, there's no controversy when you have a single uh, two level involvement, but when there is a more than three, three or more is involved, uh, one has preferences to do anterior and posterior. And how do we decide? like a patient who comes like this uh, with uh, multiple level involvement, which is better? Whether anterior only is better or posterior only is better or doing it combined. And uh, if we in a setup like this, setup in our country, we have to decide the minimal surgery with the minimal cost with the best outcome. The people who believe in anterior approach, for this case, they do multiple level discectomy and fusion. The advantage of doing an anterior approach is that the early initial recovery is better as the kyphosis case can be better corrected. People who believe in posterior, they do either a laminectomy, laminoplasty, or laminectomy with lateral mass fusion whenever there is a loss of kyphosis. But then which is better, the anterior or the posterior? This paper came in 2009, and then they analyzed, and what they, they concluded, that the correction of kyphotic alignment was better in the anterior group, and there was short-term recovery was better in the anterior, but at the end of two years, there was no significant difference, as the loss of the correction is, again, uh, a correction doesn't persist. This paper came in 2013, compared with some meta-analysis of anterior versus posterior approach for multiple levels of right spondylitis in myelopathy. And this paper came in 2014. Again, it's a meta-analysis. Now, what they concluded was that whenever there is the number of segment involved was less than three, the anterior was superior than posterior. But when it was three or more, then the results were similar. But there was one significant difference that the complication rate was higher in the anterior approach. Like the complications reported was the reoperation rate was to the extent of 16% in the anterior. And this was primarily due to, uh, due to uh, hardware failure or graft malposition or pseudoarthrosis or adjacent level disease, 12%. So uh, as compared to posterior approach, that the reoperation rate was only 0.9%. So if you compare this with the meta-analysis, it appears that posterior approach or laminoplasty is better. But what are the causes of implant failure in the anterior approach? As uh, the, the primary cause is because osteoporosis is higher in the anterior part and the bodies of the cervical than the pedicle in lateral mass. This paper came, was published in 2011 when they analyzed the, uh, the density. The highest density in the elderly was in the pedicle followed by the lamina followed by the lateral mass. And the least density was in the anterior uh, part of the body. And hence the implant failure led pseudoarthritis. Everything was higher in the anterior. So if one believes this uh, concept, probably posterior is better for 
less of implant failure rate. So keeping in mind this, probably posterior as in age, uh, old elderly patient is osteoporotic, posterior is better, but then uh, one also has to keep in mind the spine alignment is the key to recovery of the patient. Now, if one does posterior, one has to decide whether you want to do laminoplasty, laminectomy, or laminectomy plus lateral mass fusion. Now, is there a significant difference between these three, whether lateral mass fusion is better? What does the literature say? The literature, when they compared with fuse, with or without fusion, they found that there was no significant difference between uh, only laminectomy or lateral mass fusion because, uh, because at the end of 12 months, the functional outcome was similar. So if you look at this, neither the anterior or the posterior approach is better because uh, we neither anterior and posterior approach all the time, we concentrate only on decompressing the narrow spinal canal, but we never concentrated on, on uh, uh, getting back the normal alignment or physiological alignment of the spine. Normally in spondylopathy, we find three types of cycle spine, like a sigmoid cell spine, reverse sigmoid cell spine, or a kyphotic spine. And because of this, the spinal cord is stretched out. And this stretching of the spinal cord causes worsening or is the cause of the deficit. And while doing surgery, not only doing a physical decompression of the canal, one also has to restore the normal alignment so that the spinal cord is not stretched out. Like in sigmoid shape, the spinal cord also is stretched because of the deformed spine or a kyphotic uh, spine also, the spinal cord is stretched. Now what happens when, whenever the spinal cord is stretched because of deformity, if people have done evapotential animal study, when the spinal cord is stretched, the, the evapotential level fall because the blood flow reduces and especially it is more at C4 and C5 level. That is why most of the time you find myelomalacia at C4, 5 level. So a good surgery should not only stress on decompressing the spinal canal, but also restore the normal length of the spinal cord by achieving the normal alignment of the spinal cord. Now, Spinal normal alignment can be achieved by achieving the sagittal balance of the spine. Now, the either a hyperkyphotic or a hyperlordic spine is because of associated changes in the lumbar spine. So, one has to take care of the whole spine rather than just taking care of the cervical spine to have a good outcome. That this is the reason most of our patients have both neck pain together; they don't come stand alone. So how do you achieve spinal cycle spinal alignment? To achieve the spinal alignment, whenever there is a hyper uh, lordotic spine, the T the T1 vertebra is angulated more inferiorly. Hence, the superior surface of the T1, if one draws an angle from the horizontal, it becomes I mean, it becomes large. That's called the T1 slope angle. Whereas normally the T1 slope angle should be less than 20. If it's more than the it's not physiological that is why they do not improve so during surgery one has to achieve this normal slope angle and that can be achieved by using t1 also in as a fixation point during fixation so that one achieves the normal so lordosis and hence the stretching of the spinal cord is reduced so this is what is the c1 t1 slope angle which is drawn from the upper surface of the t1 uh, official plate of the t1 as a horizontal plane and the in the upper surface of the T1, that is T1 slope angle. And in uh, either a kyphotic or a hypolytic spine, the T1 slope angle increases. And do, after surgery, one has to achieve a normal T1 slope angle. And if one achieves normal slope angle, then the recovery becomes better. So this is the uh, this is what uh, is the normal spine with a normal T1 slope angle. And when you have a hyperkyphosis, the T1 slope angle increases as, as it was shown in the previous picture also. But after surgery, one can see here, we do a post-op CT scan to see that we have achieved normal the slope angle, T1 slope angle after surgery. If you have achieved this, then these are the patients who will have a better long-term uh, good recovery. 
to analyze this we studied the cases which you had done in 2015 and 16 when we were not uh, including t1 as a fixation point in 17 and 18 where we started using the t1 to to correct the achieve the settle balance we had 28 patients in this group and 38 patients in this group we we analyzed the uh, the pain score the modified uh, japanese score and the and the societal balance parameter by ct scan in these two group of patients these are the parameters which are seen the t1 slope angle the neck tilt angle the the calves angle as well as the sva what we found is in group two when the t1 was included that there is a uh, the uh, the pain score was significantly less when we had corrected corrected the settle balance by including the t1 similarly the neurological functional outcome which is statistically significant in the group 2 where settle balance was collected they had a better motor recovery and sensory recovery and this was statistically significant and achieving the t1 slope angle was also better when we included t1 rather than not included t1 and so and which was again statistically significant this is well explained so in conclusion uh, the functional uh, results of the outcome not only depends on physical decompression of the canal but achieving the sagittal balance and this paper uh, which is published in 2019 also they also stress that uh, good outcome can be achieved by correcting the sagittal balance uh, and not only the the enlarging the spinal canal in conclusion cervical thoracic junction uh, including the t1 helps in correction of sagittal balance and hence it improves neurological outcome it prevents junctional instability and using alternative levels of fixation is cost effective and safe and sagittal balance correction is equally important uh, in recovery um, as like doing a physical decompression of the canal so in uh, to conclude if you have a less than three level uh, disease it's anterior approach but if it's three or more it's the posterior approach and if you posterior approach the preferred techniques would be laminectomy with lapel splitting with settle balance correction it gives a better results and this has been accepted for publication by neurology india is in the press thank you for your attention Thank you so much, Dr. Manas, for a very comprehensive literature review of one of the most controversial topics in cervical spine, especially if more than two or three levels are involved. The decision to choose anterior or posterior, the the decision to choose anterior or posterior one is a very difficult one at times, and depends upon the pathology, the patient characteristics, and the expertise of the surgeon that is who is operating upon. And all these have to be taken into consideration for a proper decision making. And lectures like these, they help the delegate to make an informed decision. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Manas. Uh, we now move on to the next speaker, Dr. Sushil Patkar, who is the chairman of the Pune Hospital and Research Center, uh, Pune. And he will be talking about the surgical management of cervical OPLN, decision making and anterior vertebral canal expansion, a new concept. Dr. Sushil. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Please Good morning go ahead. Good all of you. Good morning. At the outset, let me thank uh, Professor Bihari, Dr. Sardana, and Dr. Merotra for this excellent opportunity. And uh, I am going to talk to you about uh, a not so very uncommon uh, problem that is uh, cervical OPLL and decision making in cervical OPLL. Why is my presentation not moving further? Okay, so no disclosures at the outset, only disclosures are teachers, Professor Ramani and Dr. Sontag from my learned certain aspects of spinal surgery. 
So OPLL is nothing else but ossification of the ligament behind the vertebral body. And excessive ossification, for what reason unknown, maybe some genetic defect in chromosome 6. And uh, there are two problems. One is uh, the compression, and the second one is the deep stretch strain. It is not just static compression, but compression along with the uh, instability, which gives rise to this, to this uh, neurological syndrome and uh, uh, the various symptoms of OPLN. It is an East Asian disease. Maybe it is an abnormal attempt for stabilization. There is an abnormal attempt, but why it occurs only in the posterior longitudinal ligament, still there is no evidence. There is, they, they say that there are some cells in the, in the posterior longitudinal ligaments which are affected by maybe hormones, maybe by blood sugar, and they show excessive ossification, which goes out of hand. So it is a kind of a keloid, a keloid of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Of course, there are classifications which are important to know for decision making, the continuous type, the segmental type, the fixed type, and the focal type. And also on axial section, it is important to know that there is a square type, there is a hill type, and there is a mushroom type. And the mushroom, this is important because those who attempt surgery should know that how this OPL is going to behave during surgery and how you are going to, because the spinal cord can be stretched over the mushroom and it is very easy to damage the dura when you're trying to remove a mushroom type as compared to a hill type. It's the easiest type of OPL. Also presence of a shadow within the OPL means that there is a dense attachment to the dura. So having knowledge of these things before on imaging are very important. So this is how the linear type, the crescent type, and the mushroom type would look on axial sections. And their, this, their knowledge to be pre-warned is to be forearmed. Now, what kind of operation can be done and when it is required, the operation? We have to remember, the, we must understand the natural history before advising surgery. 17% of asymptomatic patients will eventually develop pyelopathy. And 64% having clinical signs at the time of diagnosis will require surgery. The excellent work of Mata Sunga has given us that if there is a signal change in the cord, then maybe it is wiser to, to advise surgery rather than to wait for neurological deterioration. So you see, this is a patient who has got an OPLL with the mild changes and operated earlier. The cord migrates and there are no, not, no uh, gross deficit. But the person who is already having severe signal changes and delay operation, then even if you do a good decompression, the cord migrates backwards, but still you will see that the myelomalacia changes may even progress after That's surgery and the patient can go There is a paradox in understanding this OPLL. I'm getting somebody's sound inside. Somebody talking in the background. Okay. So OPLL, one important thing is that more extensive the OPLL, more the lordotic the spine. And more lordotic the spine, the better are the chances for posterior decompression. So you see that OPLL, if it is extensive and more extensive superiorly, inferiorly, you'll find that the curvature of the sp spine remains either neutral, neutral or lordotic and rarely becomes hyper. This is another example. So compression or instability, you have to decide what is the main problem. In this kind of patient with a neutral spine, the main problem is just the compression over here. There's hardly ever instability because the spine has gone on to, to get out of use. So you see that you see the evolution of surgery. What happened that in the Western literature, everybody had focused on anterior surgery. And mind you, this was in the 90s and 80s when a good implants had yet to come. And therefore, the complication rates of anterior surgery are very high, and people started looking towards a posterior option. It remained for Hirabayashi somewhere way back in 1981 to describe the operation of posterior decompression. Of course, subsequently, many other people described it. The technique was simple, that is, dividing the lamina on one side, making a gutter on the other side, and then tilting the spinous process to the opposite side, and maybe fixing with a plate or sutures, and expanding the spinal cord. This worked because of one very important thing that as the OPLL grew, the cord was pushed backwards and the, the tether of the cord, that is the denticulate ligaments, had already stretched. And therefore, when you expanded the spinal canal, you expanded the spinal canal. 
Dr. Merotra, there's somebody speaking in the background and that is, you know, I'm getting that sound. Is there somebody's audio which is on? Yes, sir, we have muted. Sir, we have muted everybody now. You can please thank go ahead, sir. Thank you, thank you. So these are the, this is how it works and this is how the spinal canal expanded and the denticulate ligament is already stretched so it helps in the cord to migrate backwards. The other option, of course, is to do a laminectomy. And uh, then people came out with muscle splitting, uh, uh, division of the spinous process, et cetera, to expand the spinal canal, various ways to skin a cat, various ways. And then you get an expand. You find that the cord moves backward and the subarachnoid space gets widened in the front in spite of significant compression. And that is because of the paradox of the stretched denticulate ligaments. The problem with laminectomy was that ultimately laminectomy ended in some amount of kyphotic deformity. So posterior approaches, you have laminectomy, laminoplasty, laminectomy with laminoplasty, with lateral mass fixation. The advantage of laminectomy is quick, minimal blood loss, minimal technology, fast learning curve, but definitely there's a worsening over a period of time. Laminoplasty, posterior elements are preserved. Laminectomy membrane can be prevented, restricts motion. Decompression effects are similar to laminectomy. So this is an example, you can see this, that the entire spinal canal gets widened. Laminoplasty has got problems, it's not without problems. There's neck pain, there's progression of myelopathy, there's partial relief from radic radiculopathy. And you'll find that if you really find that there's not much difference between laminectomy and laminoplasty. The review of the laminoplasty is as unstable as laminectomy. So the reason why it was being sold itself is not valid. And you'll find that there's, there's enough evidence in literature that there is no difference between laminectomy and laminoplasty. Final alignment, kyphosis relates to poor outcome. Disease progression occurs in spite of decompression. And therefore, good gardening is the key for good fusion. And I will draw your attention to my friend's work, Dr. Muthu Kumar in 2016, Neurology India, where I think at this point in time, a good decompression with reconstruction, the Lodos is using lateral mass fixation is one of the best options if one is considering posterior surgery. The other advantage is that you have got an opportunity to do root decompression because many times these patients are not just myelopathy but myeloradiculopathy. And the problem is that if you do not decompress the roots properly, there is a, there's a known complication known, which is a C5 root palsy, which gets taken care of by this kind of operation. Of course, I have also published my work for the juniors who are interested in reading how the surgery evolved and what should be done, how to select the operation. You can refer to this. So these are some examples you can see with bad OPLL. You do a laminoplasty or even in, in elderly patients, a quick laminectomy, you can get a good decompression as long as the curvature of the spine is maintained. And you'll find that in extensive OPLL, always the spine is already immobilized and the lordosis is already there. You have to remember that OPLL is not a disease which is static. This was a patient who had been operated initially, then decompressed, lamin laminectomy done. Then 2016, you see the OPLL is progressive in spite of a good decompression. And now in 2018, the patient comes with very extensive OPLL going right down up to the dorsal region. So this is a disease which does not stop with decompression. So there has, if you are accepting the theory of instability, then Immobilization is mandatory if you are trying to treat OPLL. Of course, sagittal balance became very important, and you heard Dr. Manas Panigrai's talk. So the selection in criteria is that you know, the maintaining the sagittal balance, the most important thing considered was the K line, that is a line drawn in the center of the axis to the C7, and whether the OPLL mass is anterior, the OPLL mass is anterior to the K line, it's a good case for anterior surgery. But if the occupation of the canal is more than 60% and the, K, the mass is behind the K-line, then the posterior surgery is not going to help the patient. There are various uh, concepts which are used of in making the decision in uh, uh, OPLL surgery. And canal occupation is, of course, a very important aspect. So the aims are what neural decompression, maintaining spinal alignment, and successful fixation and fusion. Anterior surgery, various studies have shown that anterior surgeries have got better results as compared to posterior surgery, but over a period of time, it squares off and does not make much difference after five years, whether you have done an anterior surgery or posterior surgery. You have to consider another very important factor in when doing these surgeries is that the 
we don't uh, we just go by literature but we have to consider individual skill and individual facilities available for doing so the complication rates increase with duration of operation with the amount of blood loss the amount of you know uh, uh, technology available to you for doing surgery Anterior surgery has various problems like graft issues, CSF leaks, graft side problem, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, as compared to posterior surgery, which is you know very easy. The only really significant complication in posterior surgery is C5 root palsy. Anterior surgery has various other injuries to the surrounding structures. I'm not against anterior surgery. I do a lot of anterior surgery, but in OPLL you have to be careful. So the overall morbidity risk associated carpectomy is between 11% to 27%. And anterior surgery is a technically demanding surgery. Anterior plating and gardening has to be done properly. I saw the videos on cortectomy and discectomy. The one of the focus while doing uh, anterior surgery is to get a good fusion. And that good fusion is not done just by removing bone, but also by preparing the adjacent vertebra. Otherwise, there is going to be graft subsidence, and that is going to uh, kind of you know, have load on the plate. I have also written about it in this chapter. So the rate of complications in CSF leave graft extrusion in was 23%, and approximately half of these 23% required second surgery. So it is not a very minor operation. There are various options and it should not make life confusing. I find that this trade-off of posterior surgery is very good. Of course, you can, if you do a good anterior surgery, maintain the lordosis, get a good fusion, you can have equally good result, but this surgery is more technically demanding than this surgery. Doing an anterior decompression is not very easy operation. It may look simple, but if not done properly, you'll add insult to injury. So this is, there are some examples, you know, this OPLL, if done properly, decompressed, this patient also had radiculopathy, you get good lateral mass fixation and decompression. Cervical laminoplasty was devised to avoid the problems associated with laminectomy, such as post-operative segmental instability, kyphosis, perineural adhesion, and late neurological evidence. But there is hardly any evidence to support that. Hardly any evidence. Now, see, this is an example who underwent laminoplasty. This is a patient, and you can see flexion extension. Even there is a, some element of you know, instability. So good decompression and lateral mass fixation definitely arrest the progress of the OPLA. Otherwise, you do a good decompression, you get initial benefit, and as the kyphosis progresses, the patient worsens again. So anterior versus posterior surgery, you see that they have done a large review from 1990 to 2013. There is very little level one evidence to say that anterior surgery is better or posterior surgery is better. There is no apparent difference. Higher rates of surgery-related complications and reoperation are seen in anterior surgery. Again, another large analysis, but from 1995 to 2015, safer with lower surgical trauma, posterior surgery. So the argument is tilting more and more towards posterior surgery. So there is only one randomized control study comparing laminectomy, fusion, laminoplasty, and showed similar neurological outcome. There, is, there are no randomized control trials comparing each op op operative option in cervical opiate. So everybody is doing what they want to do. Now, this kind of case, see, this is a cage. I am very much against these distractible cages because distractible cages, you fill the bone inside the distractible cage, and once you distract that cage, that bone is floating. So you're never going to get fusion. You're going to rely on the implant for the rest of your life. So a mesh cage is far superior, packed with a lot of bone, which ultimately is going to fuse with the vertebra above and the vertebra below, rather than a distractible cage. This is another example. This is a, this is this is the now the trade-off is to get a distractible cage with a plate fixation. But I think this is an inferior implant because you are the bone graft which you put inside just keeps on floating. After some time, it disappears, and you can see this kind of you know uh, resorption of bone which you have packed inside the cage, which is of no use. The mesh cage, of course, is a very very good option when you are treating uh, OPLL or doing anterior multilevel carpectomy. The another important thing in OPLL is that you have to remember that you have to always go beyond the OPLL if you want to get a good decompression. Just trying to remove what you see over and you know get a dura, you'll never you'll never get decompression. You have to plan the surgery by studying the CT scan very properly. The MRI is very poor. The CT scan should be studied to decide how much decompression you want to do, and then lift up the OPLL. Sometimes leave a very thin layer and. Uh, 
probably uh, there there can be always difference in opinion because i do not believe uh, that we should take the drill right down to the dura because the incidence of uh, dural tear can increase so these are examples you can see another patient with you know a lot of bone graft inside and with fusion the waterloo for anterior surgery is opl adherence to dura and interference with cord circulation people have done intraop ct scans also to confirm whether they have done good decompression i devised a technique which i was showing from the year 2015 to avoid this problem of uh, dural rent and you know de during decompression the technique was simple which involved exposing the spine like always we all are aware of it how to expose the spine and then you go up to the uncinate process and you go up to the uncinate process and you can see this this is the opll with a micro drill you first decompress the vertebral body up to about 50% 50% then the uncinate process at this level you make use of a bone saw you can even use a micro drill to reach the, this is very good for hill type of opll you go right up to the dura the last part you can even cut off with the kerosene punch you can use a 2 mm drill to do that the discectomies are done on both sides of course you must cure it and get bleeding bone from both the end plates before you put bone graft inside that is the most vital step of anterior surgery is to have bleeding bone from either vertebral edges then put a plate this is specially made for me by jeon company you can use any plate but jeon had made the screws for me where you dial the screw and as you put a nut the screw the vertebra is pulled up and uh, you break off so the vertebra with the opll is pulled anteriorly and the cord is decompressed as you tighten the nuts so you can see this case of opll and the spinal canal is narrow here at 8.6 mm and then the patient also you can see this opll and then you can see post surgery the spinal canal is widened to 11 mm because opll has got pulled up with the vertebra and this is a long term result which shows you good fusion this is a case of cervical spondylosis this treated by the sigma operation and the vertebral bodies have been pulled forward now this is this is a pictorial description how to do it you know making the vertebra half then putting the screw plates and pulling the vertebra until i'm sure most of must have understood what i am doing and uh, yes it was a good operation but it is good for only hill type of cases where you know you can reach the dura very easily for the square opl opl extending to the foramen you cannot do this operation and over a period of time i realized that if there is radiculopathy then this operation is not very good now what happened is that i was showing this from 2000 i showed this even in 2016 and then suddenly 2018 there is a paper which uh, describes the technique from another part of the world my friend ketan i am very sorry he passed away in a car accident he was you know one of my you know like my brother and who helped in most of my cases and immediately there was a letter to me from you know ajay prasad from ganga hospital that somebody has hijacked your technique but i wrote to them that it's not important many people that can get the same thought simultaneously in the world you know and it is not important to be pioneer but it is important to you know evolve the technique and make it better and better so maybe somebody got the thought maybe somebody saw my presentation but anyway i uh, i don't think that that is important so there are many other people who devise new new ways of doing it so this is making use of a plate to pull the entire aspect but these are not easy things you know they look very simple but they are not easy similarly somebody discharged of putting bone grafts and reconstructing the uh, wedge and reconstructing the lordosis and my friend atul says that you fix c1 c2 and opl will disappear so a lot of thoughts and you know various kinds of options so this is a new way where you do a posterior decompression in addition to that you put interbody grafts which are wedge shape and reconstruct the lordosis and make a new k line 
by getting the OKL mass in the anter anteriorly. I have done a few of these cases. Again, I tell you that these are not easy because to get this break behind is not easy. To reach all the way up to the dura at every level is not an easy operation. So these are some examples you can see where you do the posterior surgery and do the anterior surgery and put the wedges inside. This is a textbook, but this is not my case. This is from the book I picked up. So OPLL, where the occupation ratio is more than 60%, anterior surgery is superior. Those with some people say more with 50%, there are more complications with anterior surgery. Whatever it is, there are various ways, you know, but it's the end of the means that matter. But there's all the evidence in OPLL surgery is level three evidence. Most important, I think, is the medical fitness, your individual sur surgical skill, and the level of technology available to you. Don't get impressed by what is given in literature. Laminectomy is a very simple operation. Laminectomy with lateral mass may be slightly more difficult, but uh, you have to decide and tailor the operation as per the patient's requirements. And now, even in 2020, 21, still the jury is out. The there is no evidence still in favor of anterior surgery or posterior surgery. So ultimately, you have to decide what you can do and what your patient can tolerate Sometimes you get even you get confused with dish. Now this is an example of a patient who had this looks like OPLL, but the more important part this was a very interesting patient who was you know having difficulty to swallow, and then we had to decompress and put a bone graft. And this can mimic OPLL, but they are not OPLL. Anterior surgery and posterior surgery probably is required in some cases, but then there are some patients who are best left alone. Thank you, my dear friends. Thank you. I've finished my slides. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Cervical OPLL is one of the most difficult pathologies uh, that we encounter in the cervical spine, especially because many times these patients have other degenerative pathologies. They might have various comorbidities and also have a poor neurological status at presentation many times. And all these factors, they make OPLL surgery a very challenging pathology. And when I must uh, congratulate Dr. Patka for covering such a difficult topic in a very lucid way, and also telling us about the relatively new technique. Uh, we now move on to the next topic, which is uh, step by surgical tool, sub cervical spine, posterior fixation, lateral mass, and pedicle screw fixation. And the talk shall be delivered by Dr. Parthiban. He's a senior consultant in the Kobe Medical Center and Hospital, Coimbatore. Dr. Parthiban, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm not able to share. Can you take off your sharing? And uh, just yes, sir. Just a minute, sir. You done? Mm. Yeah. Uh, can the technical team please allow Dr. Parthiban to share the screen? Yeah, I'm able to. Okay, sir. Please. Sir. I'm not able to see Parthiban. Yeah, you're not able to see? One second. Parthiban, good morning. Yeah. I cannot see your screen. Yes, now I can see. Yes, and now it is visible, sir. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, something is coming here. What is that? Okay, anyway. Um, this is uh, going to be the elementary talk uh, after Parker made a phenomenal uh, talk on the subject of anterior approach. This is something on the, are you seeing anything like the co-host has asked you to start the video in, in front of my screen? Hello. Parthiban, I think you should just say later. So okay. please click on the later. Yes, yeah. click later. It's okay. Yes, now it is visible, sir. Please go ahead. Sir. Okay, okay that, yeah. Uh, this is especially made for this uh, um, symposium. Uh, this is about the crisp surgical videos on lateral mass and also the pedicle screws at C3 to C7. And I have made it as, you know, you see this, you learn this, enjoy this, and do the procedure. This is for the young, growing surgeons and also the, for the students. Now we are know about this uh, lateral mass of the cervical spine in the subaxial region. It's a very strong structure. 
uh, which connects the posterior and also the anterior element of the spine. That is the, uh, the lamina, spine on one side of the posterior and anterior to the vertebral body. Such a very strong um, bone structure is used for fixation technique. Um, when you look at it from posterior aspect, uh, you look at the lateral mass on the far uh, laterally, and it can be divided into four quadrants, like uh, it has been drawn here, like superior lateral, superior medial, inferior medial, and inferior lateral. Now, there is nothing in front of the superior lateral quadrant. What I mean is that the vertebral artery is just in front of the medial quadrants, proportionately in the medial quadrants. And the nerve root is starting from the superior medial and comes to the inferior lateral. So there is not, a, a, there is not much of neurovascular structures in front of the superior lateral quadrant. This is the fundamental basis of, uh, for the lateral mass screw technique. Now, this is the another diagram. You can see it. I have shown it in a bone model. A very easy, very simple for all the students to appreciate this, uh, to do the uh, posterior, posterior lateral mass screw fixation. So any screw that is inserted from the center of the lateral mass and directed in the laterally and also superiorly should be safe enough. I would like to show the uh, video on this, but there is always a question then who started on how it has gone through. You can see here, I have given a tabular problem, which starts from the Roy Camille, who said about a straight ahead, but a smaller screw. The mugger is the most, uh, most angulated one, which the screws parallel the facet joints, which I will be now demonstrating. Anderson, Cooper, and Chinelis and Hale, all those people have said, but then the principle is the same, that it starts from the midline, slightly medial, and then towards superior and lateral aspects. So this is the video. The posterior pitlet approach in a prone position to expose the spine, lamina, and the lateral mass completely to the lateral mass edge of the lateral mass. This is the medial facet line. It is torn just lateral to the laminar ridge and the junction of the lateral pass. And now I am making the lateral facet line. This is the superior facet line. And the next one is the inferior facet line. This square anatomy is the lateral mass. I draw one line from rostrum to portal with midline, and then one between the facet lines, that is the intrafacet line. These lines join together at the midpoint of the lateral mass. The entry point of the screw is slightly medial or inferior or superior, depending on the others. And the superlateral quadrant is the safest because the medial quadrants, and clearly we have the vertebral artery, and the nerve travels from the superior medial to the inferolateral quadrant. So the entry point must be in the midline or medial to the midline and directed laterally and superiorly depending on the degrees, like for example, for Michael, it must be 40 degrees parallel to the facet joints and 30 degrees to 35 degrees laterally. You can see that is the facet joint and that is the angle where you can use it for Michael technique. Uh, you can use one rope to decorticate at the midline, slightly medium to the midline, decorticate with a probe on and then later on use a 2.7 mm diamond drill bit a long handled micro drill. Enter into the midpoint and then direct it towards superior and laterally slowly and gently 
slowly and gently until we reach the proximal cortex. Once we reach the proximal cortex, we feel the resistance and a little bit more of drilling can help to enter the breach the proximal cortex. We should not use force. After that, we can use an appropriate tap You can see the line of the tap and also the screw. Now, a 3.5 mm polyaxis screw is placed, directed. This screw is placed nicely. If it is not going well, you can still more drill better. And make the anterior cortex breach. Like this, you can make the, the drilling points and the direction of the drill superior and lateral in all lateral mass. One should practice this, finding the midpoint and drilling. After drilling the the screw points, you can do the laminectomy and shape the facets or put in the grafts and then apply the final screws. You can see the direction of the screw which is going superior and lateral. Like this, all polyaxis screws can be placed one by one gently. The lateral bar's thickness will be different for each place and one should know about it. We have to read before surgery is done. Safeguard the dura and the spinal cord and then finally you can close the, the wound. Yeah, that's about the lateral mass screws. I come to the cervical pedicle. Cervical pedicle is another strong bone and uh, a node that connects the, the vertebral body uh, to the lateral mass. And this is a one strong structure, but of different uh, uh, diameters. And sometimes on one side it will be completely thin, another side, for example, sometimes the right side, the pedicles are good and the left side, the particles might be very small. So you need to be very careful in assessing and selecting for particle screw uh, placement. So the pre-operative, the study of the radiology is very, very important. Selection of the screws and the selection of the length and also the diameter is very important because the particle diameter differs and also the angulation. The angulation usually is about 25 degrees to 45 degrees. So you should be very careful. It is a bit challenging, but there are easy way to do that. Now here, you can see here, hence uh, placing a pedicle on one side take, you know, each pedicle is a separate entity. You cannot go by set standard. You know, the pedicles are all the same. It is not so. And it is much, much uh, important when there is a mild cervical scoliosis. So you have to be pretty careful. I'll show you some basic technique on this. Uh, the common entry point is uh, like what Abumi says, uh, Abumi's technique is that in the lateral mass, uh, a point just lateral to the midpoint and anatom anatomically it is just below the inferior margin of the inferior articular process of the upper vertebra, like what you are seeing there is the dot, the screw point, insertion point. And from there, the angulation is 25 to 45 degrees. Now, if you start from here and uh, you actually blind because you do not see anything anteriorly. So the vertebral artery is very close, like Sanjay was talking about in the morning. The vertebral artery is pretty very close because the pedicle, pedicles may be pretty narrow. So you have to be very careful. The steering of that is important. Otherwise, we have to take one, one wall of the pedicle in our view. That is, that is important for the technique, otherwise, you may breach the vertebral uh, foramen or the vertebral artery. Though the full vertebral foramen is not completely 
filled with the vertebral artery because sometimes vertebral artery may be abnormal. It may be thinned out or it may be uh, you know, abnormally placed. So you have to be very careful when you see the vertebral artery. It is preferable to do a CT angiogram and also three-dimensional views, uh, three-dimensional uh, 3D reconstructions so that you can see the vertebral artery and also the vertebral foramen very well before you select for the technique. Uh, this is the classical uh, technique which uh, I showed you, I, I told you about this. Um, uh, we prefer to do a lamina foramen out of like, you know, a small medial uh, decompression that is very close to the medial border of the pedicle and also the lateral border of the lamina. So that will expose the dura and that also will expose the medial border of the pedicle. This medial of the pedicle can be taken as your guideline. And then from there, you can do your pedicle screw fixation very safely. Now, I'll show you this technique now. The perched facet is exposed on the left side, and it is marked the, the facet which is uh, perched posteriorly is drilled out with a cutting bow. The cutting bow is easy to do, and then we can shift it if needed with the diamond burr. Once it is uh, very nicely drilled out, the facet perching and subluxation can be reduced directly. Uh, this is uh, medial to the lateral pass. A laminar anatomy can be done to expose the medial wall of the pedicle. So just medial to the lateral mass, into the lamina, it will nice a small laminophoraminotomy. And then we can see the dura. The dura can be retracted gently. And we can see the lateral mass and also the medial wall of the pedicle. Is absolutely clear and very nicely seen now. The entry point is through the lateral mass. And actually, if you see the markings, it is in the lateral to the midline of the lateral mass at the facet line. Now, this is the entry point. The entry is done with a drill and then a probe is uh, used to probe the pedicle directly, visualization. Usually the angles, depending on the pedicle, it will be about 20 degrees to 45 degrees, depending on the pedicle at each end. And you can use this uh, hand drill, the micro diamond drill, 2.7 mm. And after probing, a tapping can be done with a tap, which is for a 3.5 mm screw. A polyaxial screw can then be inserted into the same track. Everything is under pressure. So this is one of the easiest technique one can do, though I am showing this on a subluxated spine. On the other side, we have already placed a screw, you can see from there. And then later on, uh, use the rods and fix it. At C6, we have done a lateral mass screw fixation. Yeah, so this is the uh, CT scan you can show. You can see it very nicely, the, the screw which is directed on direct visual. Direct vision is very good because if you are going uh, blindly, then you may likely to uh, do quite a bit of damage and breathing of the canal and also the vertebral artery is possible. So I prefer to do uh, is in this technique. This is the technique which I use. Now I have demonstrated both the lateral mass and the pedicle screws for very easy application. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm-hmm.
Thank you, Dr. Partiwan, for discussing the nuances of one of the most common surgical procedures performed on the cervical spine posteriorly. The delegates would have surely learned a lot about the procedure, mm -hmm. especially because of the beautiful video. Thank you so much, Dr. Partiwan. Thank you. We move on to our final speaker, Dr. Bhattuk Diwara. He's an addition professor in the Department of Neurosurgery, Sion Hospital, Mumbai. And he will be talking about complications, management, and avoidance. Dr. Bhattuk, please. Good morning, everybody. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Jayesh Sardara and his entire team for an opportunity. I'm going to talk about the complication management and avoidance during the cervical spine surgery. When you talk about the health, you always say prevention is better than the cure. In case of the complication, I would say avoidance is better than the management. Complication starts with the decision making. Avoiding complication is best achieved with a meticulous pre-operative analysis of the pathology, good patient selection for a specific procedure, and careful execution of the surgery. Cervical spine surgery is being performed for various indications with the aim of decompression of the neural elements and stabilization as and when necessary, which can be done either anterior approach, posterior approach, or combination of both. This is a list of various complications that can happen during the cervical spine surgery. This is a paper published in the Journal of Spine Surgery, systemic review of the literature about the complication of anterior cervical spine surgery, showing the list of various common complications and their full incidences. I'm going to some, discuss some of the important complications and starts with the first, that is anterior adjacent segment degeneration called AST. It's defined as a new degenerative changes at the spinal level adjacent to the surgically treated level or level in the spine. That is accompanied by the related symptoms of radiculopathy, myelopathy, or instability. Incidence around 15% in the anterior surgery and 9% in the posterior surgery. Symptomatic AST at 5 years, prevalence is at 13%. At 10 years, almost 26%. There is a 3% risk of developing adjacent segment disease per year. Pre-existing asymptomatic degenerative changes in the segments adjacent to the fusion in the cervical spine is the most important predisposing factor. Possibility higher after a single level fusion than the multiple level fusions. This can be best prevented by the restoration and the preservation of the cervical sagittal profile by doing a function of a fusionless surgery. Plating can hasten ASD if it is placed within the 5 mm of adjacent cranial disc segment and this should be avoided. Another problem is the esophageal uh, injury. Commonest one is the dysphagia because of the intraoperative manipulation, that is because of the ischemia of the pharyngeal or esophageal wall. Other causes include edema, hematoma, and the infection. Chances increase after more than two levels of ACF and the revision surgery. Most of the uh, patients will have a, resol a resolution of the symptoms within a week, sometimes take uh, months. Most of these patients can be treated with the soft diet via orally or a rails tube. The role of the steroid is debatable in this condition. Esophageal perforation is, a, is another problem because of the retraction or the direct surgical manipulation. If it is suspected during the surgical procedure, one can inject the methylene blue through the rails tube and the site of perforation can be identified. Once identified, it can be directly repaired or with the help of the flap coverage. At the level of precopharyngeal region, posterior esophageal mucosa is covered by the very thin facial layer. So in case of the screw backouts, implant loosening or the migration, there is a high chance of esophageal perforation. This can be best managed by the broad, anti anti uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, exploration, debridement, and the removal of the hardware, primary repair of the esophageal defect using the pedicular muscle flaps, and supplementation of the nutrition via Riles tube, gastrostomy tube, or the genostomy tubes. When the leak is very small, one can uh, manage uh, esophageal perforation conservatively. This injury can be best prevented by the blunt finger dissection below the superficial cervical fascia and the careful intermittent retraction of the esophagus uh, during the anterior surgical exposure. Postoperative C5 palsy is another problem, can be uh, defined as a de novo or aggravating muscle weakness mainly at C5 region without, without sensory disturbances following cervical spine surgery. There are some peculiar characteristics 
more than 50% accompanied by the sensory disturbances or intolerable pain. 92% patient will have a hemilateral, almost all palsy occur within a week. Incidence is same between the entry and post approach. The prognosis is relatively good even in the patient with a severe muscle weakness. C5 nerve root injury can be because of the two different theories. One is a segmental spinal cord disorder theory, which, may, which suggests that anterior horn cell is thought to be chemically damaged because of the preoperative ischemia and aggravation of the reactive oxygen during the postoperative reperfusion. According to this theory, there are various ne uh, uh, neuroprotective agents such as antioxidant and drugs and calcium channel blockers were proposed. But the effectiveness of these uh, drugs is not being reported. While in case of the uh, other theory of uh, nerve root injury, thought to be caused by the mechanical compression or the destruction of the anterior nerve root, uh, nerve rootlets or nerve root. By contrast, for, uh, for nerve root injury theory, because this theory is based on the mechanical factor, various surgical intervention developed, which includes avoiding excessive prolonged lateral stretch on, on the multifidus muscle, doing a foraminotomy in advance while uh, 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 performing a cervical laminate, laminoplasty, avoiding posterior shape of the spinal cord by limiting the angle of open lamina and also by limiting the width of the resection of the lamina. Once injury happens, elbow should be flexed and shoulder should be slightly abducted to decrease the distraction force to the C5 nerve root. And this can be best achieved by simply putting a pillow under the axilla with the patient lying in the bed. Bone graft failure related problem mainly in uh, cases with the corpectomy because of the large, larger destabilization of the anterior column. There, is a, there are very high risk of graft migration, graft dislodgement, infection, and the pseudoarthrosis. Most of this graft dislodgement happens within 24 hours. Grafts can also fracture, collapse, subsidize, or there will be non-union. When the posterior uh, column is deficient, greater compression in the shear loads on the stud grafts increases the risk of fracture, subsidence, and the dislodgement. Partial dislodgement can be treated conservatively, while the total dislodgement requires the revision surgery. Posterior instrumentation is and fusion required when anterior multi-level fusion collapse uh, or the graft subsidence happens, especially in case of the osteopenia. This can be best prevented by the good preparation of the graft, obtaining a parallel fusion beds and sitting the graft under the load from the cortical bone. Two or three levels corpectomy should be uh, supported by the posterior instrumentation. Pseudoarthrosis is a late complications. There are various factors and the smoking, osteoporosis, uh, NSAIDs increases chances of pseudoarthrosis, diagnosed mainly on the lateral uh, flexion extension X-rays. This can be best prevented by using a bone substitute, which includes the bone morphogenic proteins. Recurrent laryngeal now injury is a, uh, one has to be very aware about these complications. One can see the uh, course of the uh, on the right side, now almost pass beneath this right subclavian artery, while in case of the left side almost go beneath the aortic arch. The chance of injury very high on the right side compared to the left side. Recurrent laryngeal nerve injury will result in a, a, a hoarseness, dysphonia and vocal cord palsy. Most of this uh, um, uh, deficit improves uh, partially or completely over a period of time. There are various causes described in the literature regarding the nerve injury. And among them, uh, retraction or overstretching resulting in neuroplexia is the most important thing. Safe side of to approach is a controversial. Some studies show the no difference between the side of the approach and the incidence of nerve palsy while then the recommended left-sided approach. Right-sided approach is technically easier as most of the surgeons are right-handed. The risk is uh, increased uh, when the surgery is performed below C4 and in case of the revision surgery. This injury can be best prevented by avoiding far little ligature of the inferior thyroid vessels, a proper ca uh, careful dissections, placement of the retractor blades under the longus collar muscle belly, use of sharp tooth retractor blades rather than the plane, revision surgery, 
one uh, to minimize the iatrogenic injury from the exploring a scar surgical field other side should be used while in case of the previously uh, uh, laryngeal nerve injury to avoid a potential risk of bilateral vocal cord palsy approach from the same side is recommended dural tear and the csf leak uh, are the important co complications incidence increases in with the revision surgery risk factor includes the old age thin dura uh, because of the common compression ossification of the uh, ligamentum phlegm and the scarring from the previous surgery one has to use the uh, ligamentum phlegm and the posterior ligaments as a uh, as they are a helpful barrier whenever possible there should be attempt to repair the tears fat fibrin glue and mesh coverage can be uh, best utilized persistent csf leak fistula or a pseudomelanogen one should consider for the revision surgery bone graft harvest side problems can be minimized by watertight closure use of drain careful handling of the soft tissue avoid excessive retraction minimal subperiosteal dissection and oblique incision especially while taking a bone graft from from the posterior uh, crest one can easily damage the superior cluinal nerve uh, as the cross uh, cross lateral to the posterior superior iliac spine so despite the uh, benefits of cervical spine surgery there are still many possible complications careful knowledge about the important structures and their handling helps in prevention most complications are manageable with adequate preparation when carefully and properly executed cervical spine surgery can be effective with an acceptable rate of complication thank you thank you very much for patient listening thank you good morning everybody at the outset thank you dr Thank you, Dr. Batuk, for talking about complication management and avoidance. The dictum of medical science is first to no harm, and so it is extremely important for all of us to understand the ways of avoiding complication. And if any complication occurs, then how can we manage them? And Dr. Batuk covered all the major complications in his talk, and I am sure the delegates would have learned a lot regarding avoidance and management of various complications. I again thank all the speakers. Uh, we have received many questions from the delegates, but due to paucity of time, uh, we will limit. The, the questions. So the first question is uh, by Dr. Rachit, and I would like to post this question to Dr. Vandan Vela and Dr. Sanjay Bihari. That what are the intraoperative landmarks for identifying vertebral artery in anterior cervical spine approach, especially in cases of degenerative spine disease? So Dr. Vandan and Dr. Sanjay can please discuss about this topic. I have the question again, please. Sir, intraoperative landmarks uh, for identifying vertebral artery in anterior cervical spine approach, especially in cases of degenerative spine disease. Yeah, the first thing is in intraoperatively, the, what we are taught is the yeah. amount of uh, uh, the, of the uh, disc space which you do. Okay, so intraoperatively, it is uh, ideally you do not see the vertebral artery. Because it is hidden by the foramen as well as the longus coli muscle. So uh, one has to know how much to dissect the longus coli muscle on each side. Okay? And it should not be more than 0. 0.5. Seconds. Cannot hear Dr. Varnan. I cannot hear Dr. Varnan. Yeah. Can you hear me now? The volume is very less. The volume, okay. Can Dr. Varnan's volume is very, very feeble. Can you, can you hear me now? Slightly better, but not uh, not not like the other guys. Okay, I yeah. can I can't be loud. Yeah, now it is better. Yeah, I can't be loud. Than you. <laughs> so you should no, speak no, like no, uh, yeah, So the important thing is, first of all, if you are looking for the, uh, you should not be looking for the vertebral artery when you are doing an anterior approach. That is number one. Okay, <laughs> because it is well protected. But the area where it is uh, not protected would be between uh, the two vertebral bodies when it is when you if you go too laterally and that is beyond a certain uh, place that is beyond the unco vertebral joint. So you have to be very very careful when you are dissecting the longus coli. As long as you are on the bone, it is okay to use the a little bit of monopolar. But when you are in the disc space at the level of the disc space, you would suddenly fe feel a uh, sort of a giveaway, which is a dangerous area, and that would be the area which where the vertebral artery uh, would be lying on both the sides, and that would be vulnerable. Okay, and that's the area one can damage it. And the uh, technique is not to dissect the longus coli too laterally, because there are two things you can damage. One is the vertebral artery, 
you can also damage the sympathetic chain, which is also uh, can create a lot of problem. Can I have? Can I ask a question to Doctor uh, uh, Doctor Sanjay Bihari? Uh, yes, sir. Please sir, go ahead, sir. Uh, this is uh, uh, that was a uh, that was a very nice presentation on the anatomy. I have a question that uh, uh, would you consider entry point for C one? That is when you are putting the lateral mass screw. Can you consider? Will you consider entry point to be on the ridge rather than under the ridge? No. Sometimes it is uh, if there is a very very atrophic uh, occipital condyle and fusion fused with C one lateral mass, and you are not getting enough space, then it might be a good idea to go through the joint space and go through the joint space and aim for the anterior tubercle of C one. So that's also a very very nice. Oh, uh, no no, I I think I didn't make uh, make it very clear. That is when the when the C one is well formed, it's a normal uh, segmentation. That is instead of uh, going under the uh, under the posterior arch when you are entering the 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 lateral mass, why not puncture the 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 posterior arch itself with a very fine drill and then gradually go on increasing. and uh, it gives a better purchase i have tried it in a few times you can go through the posterior arch also and it gives a better purchase and the profile is good and it matches with the c2 yeah. so so supposing you want to go higher than the ganglion then that is a very good technique but the only problem is that sometimes the vertebral artery forms yeah. a groove into Thank the So when you are putting the screw, that you can actually injure the dominant vertebral artery there. So it is much better to do it under vision, which means you drill the posterior arch to the level of the lateral mass, and once you reach that point, which is the Sandeep is not there. I request the panelist to the other panelist to please take up. There is a disc as well as an osteophyte. Sometimes distraction injuries are more uh, problematic. And I think are the other panelists. Because yes, especially in 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 spondylotic uh, pathologies. even if you are done a discect me you don't get adequate space to yeah. to enter the uh, to go to the posterior longitudinal ligament so you have to distract uh, the with the vertical body distractor vertical body distractor actually goes inside the disc space while if you put the vertical spreader i mean you can put a pin outside the, on the on the vertical body and then distract it i think that's much more convenient yeah I, my, my view is that you know pin distracts are so very good um it always gives a angulation right and as you rightly pointed out when you drill the osteophytes if you wanted to go for example on the upper upper vertebral lower osteophyte then you have to direct it from uh, caudal to cranial your your drill angle is caudal to cranial But so you, you you need you need a little bit of uh, uh, the vertebral artery distress like this then you can put the drill like this so that is easier What, what sandeep was showing was uh, he was making one statement zero profile system so it, he he has just straight bent and and the fix that zero profile uh, spacer now if you want to distract or you want to do a kyphotic angulation then you need you need a this pin retractor i prefer that one important point which came up was uh, very interesting and that is uh, Uh, you know the related to graft subsidence because dr patka patka also said that uh, you know you he doesn't want a, a you know uh, an expandable cage and many people would not do uh, uh, you know bicortical decompression um, simply so that they don't want graft subsidence so what is the opinion of the panel on this would you actually want it for a single level discectomy to do a, a small amount of cortical removal or you would not want the cortical removal Now, what what is your question, Doctor Bihari? I didn't get your question. No, the question is: Would you like to uh, drill the end plates 
uh, when you are doing a, a disectomy or uh, because you know you said that graft subsidence can occur with an expandable cage also so yeah, you, yeah. rather than drilling rather than drilling one has to make holes in the end plate with a micro drill you must make you know like a, like at least seven eight holes on top and seven eight holes below with a very fine drill bit so that there's cancellous bone oozing out of it bleeding or oozing otherwise the fusion is not going to take place all the bone grafts that we put are actually sequestered they are not having blood supply and up to 20% subsidence is going to occur with any bone graft that you put and therefore to for that you have to put a bone graft slightly larger than your defect and uh, you have to accommodate for that subsidence which is going to take place and now there is a little bit of you know controversies uh, on one side is rigid fixation on other side is micro motion rigid fixation increases the chances of non union and micro micro movement enhances the chances of fusion so in single level discectomy i don't think there is any role for uh, plate fixation or screw fixation but if you are doing more than single corpectomy or more than single level then of course you need to do some kind of fixation but for a standard single level discectomy using a bone graft or a peak cage and see that the, you have made all the garden i call it gardening if you have done the correct gardening in the end plates and see that there is going to be bleeding from the end plates and you have got lot of bone graft over a period of time what has happened is that with newer cages and newer implants the amount of bone graft which was being used has just shrunk to micro level and therefore the complications have increased i think uh, if you look back and see when the time when these cages were not used the fusion rates were much better it is with uh, taking cages the amount of bone inside that the people who make use of osteoids and edges of the bone to pack into the cage which i think is just wishful thinking that is not going to cause any fusion whatsoever i think parthipan you are from the same school like me what is your opinion you yeah, i'm sorry there was some uh, disconnection in my this one i understand Okay. I I don't I don't like the uh, the expandable cages. From the beginning, it was not going with the concept of fusion at all. Uh, it is just just putting the beams without putting the cements, and the the volume of the graft within that expansible uh, is very 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 limited. I personally prefer the 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 cages. That is the uh, the threaded cages, which are very large, which can which can uh, which can have a lot of cancellous bones. Uh, expandable cages i'm sorry because many times we have seen subsidence it has gone into the cancellous part very heavily by by the time you know by 3 years or 4 years uh, if if you carefully unless you sub uh, unless you add an anterior uh, implant to that otherwise they just sink in so there are two a couple of questions from delegates and i think uh, it's better if we can ask those questions so there is one question i would like dr bhatoi dr shah and dr manas to take up this question that uh, in which cases would you advocate a 360 degree fusion in what what are the indications for a 360 degree fusion now the first dr bhatoi dr shah and dr manas to please take up this question no uh, well as far as uh, 360 degree fusion is concerned i think it it all depends on the extent of the pathology that is if it is say more than two segments involvement and there is a uh, associated spinal deformity as well so that is other anything other than lumbar uh, other than cervical lordosis and uh, these that would be an indication for uh, 360 degrees uh, fusion and uh, other than that of course if it's a post traumatic lesion one can consider 360 degree fusion and of course if there is an oncology uh, uh, say uh, basis or oncological involvement then also one can consider 360 degree thank you dr shah would you like to add to this the indication that dr bhatoi just mentioned basically we are doing mostly a posterior approach for all of our pathologies and managing most of our situations posteriorly and indications for 360 degree fusion are relatively few maybe for a tumor that is uh, you know oncology uh, just like dr bhatoi say for a tumor maybe you would like to go anterior and posterior uh, otherwise other than that i think we are able to do everything posteriorly Dr. Manas, Dr. Deswal has asked that whether we can do 360 degree fusion. Any indication of 360 degree fusion for degenerative spine disease? So, uh, for degenerative, like uh, if you have compression both anterior and posterior, many times you uh, have an anterior multiple level uh, disc plus uh, hypertrophy of the uh, yellow ligament. Uh, in that case, uh, 
uh, even if it's a short segment, just doing an anterior will not be enough unless the posterior ligaments also uh, means post-op scan. So many times you see that the posterior compression is persisting. So in a degenerative spine, if, if you have a, a means I'll first prefer to do a posterior decompression and uh, if the post-op scan shows it's not uh, anteriorly, it is still persisting, then only they'll do an anterior. And in trauma, if you have a bilateral uh, facet lock and where you have to unlock the facet uh, to reduce, uh, those cases again, you'll do a 360 degrees. And tumors, uh, when you have both the whole posterior and the anterior elements are involved, uh, in those cases, again, you'll prefer a 360 degrees. One, one more one more indication would be a long segment corpectomy yeah. with a significant kyphosis and uh, put in our graft and then for an additional stabilization you just turn the patient around and also do a posterior stabilization that sometimes yeah means mean, this is what uh, similar mean, uh, when you do a long segment uh, they come after five four five years which dr Par susil Parker was showing an example with implant failure more than uh, three level uh, and then for them, revision surgery is difficult, uh, and doing a posterior fixation uh, is uh, uh, um, is uh, is required. But if if you had done a three sixty from the beginning, probably would have avoided that complication. Okay. Uh, there was a question from yeah. the four people who are asking the same question. And uh, uh, how do you manage intraoperative dural tears in anterior cervical spine injury? Oh, sorry, in anterior cervical spine surgery. Um, I, Any of the nowadays, yeah, yeah. Nowadays we use actually we've used uh, Duragen, and uh, it has worked uh, very well. Earlier used to put fat and fibrin glue, uh, but now if I have a dural tear, I I place a Duragen on that, and uh, and that has uh, worked well for me. I don't know others. What is your other experience? Dr. Vello and Dr. Matoy, please. Uh, if, if, if it if it is just a puncture wound, if it is just a puncture, normally uh, we. I mean, we don't do anything. Just uh, maybe a bit of fascia or a bit of uh, fat, and wait for some time, uh -huh. and that that settles it. And uh, anything, uh, anything larger than that, biopsy, no? so, one may have to use uh, biological glue and uh, maybe a bit of uh, okay, uh, okay, fascia. Okay. And uh, usually that settles that. It, uh, uh, I don't know. I've never seen a chronically uh, uh, say discharging wound. So normally it settles with that. Any, any, any dual tear. Dr. Shah, would you use uh, lumbar drain in any case of... Uh, no, I won't do it. OPLL, won't. If there is a major dural tear. Many times the dural comes off with the OPLL. So in that case, how do you manage a big dural dent, uh, in specifically in cases of OPLL? We would manage first only with a local uh, fat or maybe some muscle graft in the area and just cover it a little bit with a gel foam or something. And that works in most of the situations. We don't use lumbar drain unless it's a huge tear and you think you will not be able to do it, then you can use a lumbar drain, but not in the usual situation. It settles with just a fat graft or a muscle patch. No, a large tear is unlikely to leak. It is mostly the small, yeah. uh, tiny leak, tiny tears or tiny punctures which are likely to leak. Just one last question. Uh, yeah, can I, can I just comment on the lumbar drain? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir please. Yeah, uh, I mean, sir. When earlier used to use fat and, and uh, fibrin glue, uh, one of our patients came back after 15 days with a pseudo meaning a collection of CSF and we had put a lumbar drain and then it subsided. Uh, not perioperative, not after surgery. In no, because that is true specifically in OPLL because sometimes the, with the bone chunk, the dura also tears off and that actually leaves a large dent in, in the entire part of the... Yeah, I don't, dura in works very well in those cases. Yeah. I think uh, CSF leak is a function of persisting compression. If your decompression is adequate, howsoever you tear the dura anteriorly, there'll never be a CSF leak. But if your decompression is incomplete, you are sure to get CSF oozing out of that. So whenever you get a dural drain, first spend a lot of time in seeing that you've done adequate decompression above, down, and side to side. If there is anything indenting into the dura, rest assured that CSF leak is going to persist. Can I, can I have, have a point just to make to Dr. Uh, Sushil that uh, he spoke of uh, post-operative appearance of myelomalacia. You think there is a, there is a, a factor of spinomedullary dynamics in this because whenever there is a movement of the spine, the spinal cord moves by about an inch within the spinal canal and repetitive yeah. movements. 
over maybe a maybe a, a, a compression which we decided not to decompress at that moment of time so this spinal medullary yeah. dynamics it's a dynamic uh, factor which can yeah. lead to which can lead that to post op pathophysiology that is the pathophysiology of opll that is not just static compression but yeah. dynamic compression also it is a dynamic which gives rise to progression of symptoms so due to positive time we'll just take one more question that uh, how do you choose between lateral mass fixation and uh, pedicle screw in subaxial spine i would request dr vandan valley and dr putti and uh, dr parthiban to take up this question please uh, parthiban you go first since you had presented it parthiban so you are muted parthiban uh, you are muted i am muted okay See, uh, this is a very good question, but I prefer most of the cases I do the lateral mass because one, it is simple. Uh, and uh, C7, yes, I, I go ahead with uh, uh, with the pedicle fixation because it is very simple. It is uh, more or less like what you do for upper thoracic uh, pedicle screw fixation. So it is more simple. But when you come above, see, for example, from C6, C5, and C4, and C3, the, actually, the pedicles becomes thinner and they are more angulated. So, I mean, less angulated and it be thinner. So, you have to be very, very calculative before you're putting into that. So, before I take up the pedicle screw, decision on pedicle screw, I, I must have a good pedicle first. So, that is my criteria first. But if you have a very good lateral mass, lateral mass is the first choice of preference. Uh, between from C3 to C6, lateral mass. C7 is pedicle. So this is the basic uh, principle I follow. Now, uh, if you have a, a gross dislocation and your lateral mass is also fractured there, the lateral mass is also breached, then you have to see the viability, see the integrity of the pedicle and use the pedicle direct vision, the technique which I showed. The technique which I showed shows very clearly the medial border of the, the pedicle. So one, one area, one, one angle, you are very clear that you are not uh, violating the uh, one sector that is the canal. The other one is the. I think we have lost uh, Dr. Patiman. Dr. Velev can, can add to what Dr. Patiman was saying. Pedicular screw is more difficult. It is easier in a C2 and in a C7. Okay. So the C3 to C6 are more difficult areas to um, get the pedicle. So in my practice, I am more uh, comfortable using a lateral mass screw for the C3 to C6. If I have to do a pedicular screw, I would prefer to have a partial hemi laminectomy done on one side, expose the nerve root, and then go in for the pedicle. So that is more safer. You know where you are, and you can get the angle. Another word of caution for pedicular screws from C3 to C6 is you have to study the CT scan in the axial cuts. So where you have to know the angle of the pedicle and you have to know the lie of the pedicle, which is very, very important. Another problem is we do not get screws which are 2.5 centi uh, centimeter millimeters uh, diameter. We get mostly 3.5 and 4 uh, millimeters diameter screws. So that becomes slightly difficult if the pedicle is smaller than 2.5 millimeters. One, one small technique that I'd like to tell you about lateral mass fixation, and that is if you if you rest the, the long arm of your instrumentation um, on the spinous process and keep it parallel to the lamina, putting a lateral mass upwards and outwards is a very simple thing between C3 and C6. So the important thing is to rest the, rest the long arm of the instrument on the spinous process of the, of the vertebra you are actually uh, putting the pedicle screw in and then stay parallel to the lamina and then go into the lateral mass. So that really helps in uh, getting the right trajectory and direction and avoiding injury to the vertebral artery. Uh, two people have asked. I'm, sir, had, got, I'm, got reconnected. I'm sorry, I've got reconnected. I think I make the point again yes. and, and I'm very sorry because there's some problem recently. Uh, as I said, that pedicle uh, selection, I already discussed about it. And I also joined with uh, Sanjay about this point uh, which I made long time ago, when you wanted to go superior and laterally, automatically your long drill, you know, handle, it comes and, and sits on the spinous process down. You always can resist, I mean, rest over that and direct it, as you saw in the my video. Uh, this gives a very good steady and uh, the, 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 the probing, the probing of the, uh, the, the lateral mass. So I think, I think that is, that's correct, Sanjay. 
thank you uh, just uh, two people have asked one question so i would like to ask a question to dr batuk and dr cha and dr manas can please step in that uh, how do you manage a post operative dysphagia in patients of uh, patients who have been operated upon anterior cervical spine post operative dysphagia dr batuk dr cha and dr manas please if you can just step in <clears throat> yeah can i uh, talk on yeah please please go yeah. ahead so as i mentioned about that the, the dysphagia may be the two reasons like most of the com commonest one is the uh, 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 intra operative handling of the soft tissue sometime because of edema formation sometime because of the retraction one can have so as i mentioned if it is a significant one has to one has to give a soft diet in the immediate peri operative period second thing and the, if and if patient cannot tolerate the oral diet then one has to because most of the time during the anterior cervical spine surgery we use uh, we keep a rice tube so we have uh, one has to give a feeding through the rice tube third important thing is the use of the steroid it is a debatable uh, uh, role of the steroid some studies uh, prefer the use of the steroid in a patients of the post operative dysphagia and some uh, studies uh, are against fourth important thing is the uh, 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 fluoroscopic uh, study of the uh, esophageal function and if one can see there is a significant uh, 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 one can see that there is a significant uh, uh, restriction or you can see the flow of the uh, through the uh, during the deglutition study then uh, uh, one has to avoid uh, uh, giving the oral fluids for a, a few days thank you thank you so much uh, uh, thank you all for a wonderful session and uh, thank you all for sparing your precious time Uh, thank you all thank you very much now let us move on to the next session that is the keynote session and uh, i request dr jayesh to please take over from here thank you